Welcome to the morning worship service of Big Springs Community Church. Uh, may this worship service be a nourishment to our souls uh, for this day and also for the rest of this uh, coming week. Today uh, we have all the announcements and prayer items uh, listed in the back of our bulletin. Um, I will be here uh, this whole week. Uh, ladies Bible study and sewing group will be uh, here um, this week. Uh, also, the um, um, well, we won't call it Christmas Bazaar anymore. Um, Hol- Holiday Bazaar will be November 14th, right? So uh, we will post uh, the announcements on the uh, church board sign there uh, by the street. Also, um, please uh, bring canned goods for the food pantry uh, next Sunday or any day of this week. Um, Just a reminder, uh, also because uh, we have the luncheon fellowship next Sunday. Also, we have a sign-up sheet in the back wall there for the luncheon um, fellowship, the potluck, we call it. Um, So... Uh, if you want to uh, bring um, a main dish or salads or fruits or desserts, you can sign up there in the back wall. Okay, so those are uh, the um, announcements I'd like to highlight. One other announcement that I'd like to mention is the uh, Bible study. Uh, Since we missed uh, several Saturdays of uh, Bible study, we will continue this Saturday. And we will uh, be continuing our discussion on Romans 8, uh, 38 and 39, uh, the assurance of our salvation, and also uh, going to Romans uh, 9, 10, and 11. So that's for this coming Saturday. No anniversaries or birthdays this coming week. Okay, so um, there are actually a couple of uh, prayer items that I'd like to mention. Um, One is for uh, Beverly, who has had uh, kidney stone surgery, and uh, we pray for her continued uh, recovery and complete recovery. And and maybe one of these Sundays uh, she will join us. Also, Edna is not uh, feeling well uh, today uh, because of her, uh, I guess, sciatic uh, nerve in the back. So we'll also pray for her. Okay, those are the announcements today. Let us stand and have a moment of silent prayer to prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Let us pray. Almighty God, on this uh, day of worship, we ask that you will fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit, and may our hearts also be uh, completely focused on you on this worship service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God summons us to worship this morning from Psalm 96. Ascribe to the Lord, all families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will, be ju- he will judge the peoples with equity. People of God, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. God greets us with this greeting as he welcomes us into his presence. 
to all those in Big Springs Community Church who are loved by God and called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, guide and direct us by your Holy Spirit that we may not exalt ourselves, but humbly fear you with our whole hearts. Hear and keep your word and hallow the Lord's day. With your word, help us to place our hope and confidence in your Son, Jesus Christ, who alone is our righteousness and Redeemer, and then to amend and better our lives according to your word, that we may avoid all offenses and finally obtain our complete and perfect and eternal salvation. Through your grace in Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us remain standing and sing our song of praise. O Father, you are sovereign, number 233. Uh, this is uh, also related to our topic or theme this morning. Oh, Father, you are sovereign in all the worlds you made. Uh, your mighty word was spoken and light and life obeyed. The seasons and, and the oceans are also under your care. And also, he is sovereign, second verse, in all the affairs of men. You may all be seated. Every Lord's Day, we read a portion of God's law that shows us God's holiness and our sinfulness. And therefore, uh, the law, as uh, we read them in the Bible, is our guide as Christians to godly living. Uh, and for the unbeliever, it directs them to a Savior who is Jesus Christ uh, to be saved from his sins. And so this is... God's will for our lives from 1 Peter 2, beginning with verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. 
Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. And so these words remind us of our duties as Christians to uh, be uh, subject to all human authority, whether it is the government, whether it is our uh, employer, whether it is our teacher or parents. Um, and the second is that uh, we are to suffer for Christ. We are to endure suffering for Christ. And so this, these two commands are sometimes very hard for us to uh, fulfill. And so we are called by God to uh, confess, uh, acknowledge our sins, confess our sins when we commit them. So we have this uh, prayer printed in our bulletin that we will pray together. And as we pray this prayer of confession, uh, we uh, uh, remember our own personal sins. Almighty God, you since you delayed with so much patience the punishment which we have deserved and daily draw on ourselves, grant that we may not indulge ourselves, but carefully consider how often and in how many different ways we have provoked your wrath against us. May we learn humbly to present ourselves to you for pardon, and with true repentance plead for your mercy. With all our heart we desire to submit ourselves to you, whether you chastise us, or according to thine infinite goodness, forgive us. Let our condition be ever blessed, not by flattering ourselves in our apathy, but by finding thee to be our kind and wonderful Father, reconciled to us in your only begotten Son. Amen. So, by the way, this is a prayer prayed by uh, the great reformer John Calvin in Geneva. So, God assures us that if we confess of our sins, our sins and repent of them, uh, he is faithful and just to forgive us all our sins. So, he has assurance uh, today from 1 Peter 2, verses 24 to 25, that God forgives us in his Son, Jesus Christ. For he himself bore our sins in his body and on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls." So let us now come to God in our prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful Father in heaven, you have promised us that if we pray according to your will and in your holy word, you would hear us. So we pray this morning for your church, for our nation's civil authorities, and for our brothers and sisters here at Big Springs Community Church. Uh, we humbly pray that you would be merciful to your whole church, your chosen people, wherever they live upon this earth. Defend them from the rage and, and tyranny of our enemy, the devil, the world, and the lusts of this world. Give your gospel a free and joyful uh, passage uh, to be preached throughout the world for the conversion of those who have uh, whom you have chosen. Uh, bless the churches and the communities we live in with peace, justice, righteousness, and also true faith. Give us understanding of your word 
and make us uh, uh, conform to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Comfort as many among us who are sick and comfortless in body and mind. As uh, we witness the chaos, uh, fear, and discouragement all our, around our nation in this uh, election time, many are in the grip of despair and discouragement. But our hope is not in kings or armies or human wisdom. But nevertheless, according to your command, we pray that you would bless our country's leaders and increase in them the gifts and spiritual graces which make them fit for those jobs where you have appointed them. Make them a terror to evildoers and a rewarder of the good. Direct the leaders of our country to lead the people in justice, righteousness, unity, and peace. Hasten, O Savior, the time of your return. Send forth your angels and let the dreadful, joyful trumpet sound. Do not delay, for our, our time is dangerous. Do not delay, for this earth and this world could be like hell, and your church uh, be divided and be crumbled to dust. So we pray also for those in our congregation and among our families and friends, the needy, the, the homeless, the elderly, the sick, the troubled, the grieving, and those who are looking for work. In your wise and kind providence, you have appointed us for sickness or pain or afflictions. We pray especially this morning for Beverly as she recovers from her uh, surgery. We pray for comfort in body and soul for her. We also pray for Edna as she tries to alleviate the pain that she is suffering from and that uh, the doctors would be able to uh, give her um, the right medications. We pray that you would uh, stay by them and all the others who are suffering. Keep their hearts in sweet recollection of you. That way, in the multitude of our hearts, sorrows, and bodily pain, your comforts may refresh our souls. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. And we pray all these things through Christ our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It is not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So every Lord's Day, we read a portion of our creeds and confessions that is related to our sermon. Uh, let us be mindful that only the scriptures are the inerrant and infallible and inspired word of God, but these creeds and confessions uh, supplement and summarize what the scriptures tell us. Today, we will read a portion of the Belgic Confession of Faith, Article 36, and uh, we will read the first two paragraphs only. Uh, we will read them together. So, Belgian Confession of Faith, the Civil Government, Article 36. We believe that because of the depravity of the human race, our good God has ordained kings, princes, and civil officers. He wants the world to be governed by laws and policies so that human lawlessness may be restrained and that everything may be conducted in good order among human beings. For that purpose, he has placed the sword in the hands of the government to punish evil people and protect the good. So next Sunday, we will read uh, the rest of the 
Article 36 of the Belgic Confession of Faith. Let us now um, stand and sing our song of thanksgiving, number 119, and uh, we will sing uh, verses, uh, stanzas 1 through 4. 119N is from Psalm 119, verses 105 to 112. seated. Uh, a reminder that uh, our uh, gifts, uh, you can uh, give your gifts and offerings on the uh, plates, offering plates in the back. Uh, today I will, uh, starting today, I will take a break from our study of Mark and actually uh, we only have one more sermon yeah, in the book of Mark, but the, you know, this um, season has overtaken us, so I will take it up again probably after Christmas. Uh, that's a long time. But uh, today I will um, start um, our series, um, three sermon series on the relationship uh, about the civil government as, as we uh, read in also in the Belgian Confession of Faith. So I will read first from Isaiah 44, verse 28, all the way to Isaiah 45, verse 6. So Isaiah 44, starting with verse 28, the word of the Lord. The Lord says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall fulfill all my purpose, saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built, and of the temple, your foundation shall be laid. 45 verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him, and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him, that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places, that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me. That people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. And then we go to our main text in Romans chapter 13. Be, uh, beginning with verse 1 to verse 7. The word of the Lord from the epistle of 
Paul to the Romans, chapter 13, beginning with verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Thus far, the reading of God's holy and inerrant word. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Beloved congregation of Christ, uh, let me uh, first read this quote, and I quote, If this country doesn't give us what we want, then we will burn down the system and replace it. And I could be speaking figuratively. I could be speaking literally. This was a threat made by a Black Lives Matter leader in New York last June during the height of the violence, rioting and looting and murders after the death of George Floyd while he was being arrested by police officers. And the violence has not stopped since then. Many celebrities have imagined violence and even killing the president. The worst of these were a picture of comedian Kathy Griffin holding a fake decapitated Trump head, Madonna thinking hard about blowing up the White House, and Johnny Depp imagining an actor assassinating the president alluding to the assassination of President Lincoln by the actor John Wilkes Booth. And when the president was hospitalized after being infected with COVID-19, many liberal politicians and activists and celebrities wished him death. So the hatred of liberals against conservatives and against Christians is unimaginably wicked. So this hatred built up in the last four years and has now come to a head in this election year. But Jesus, Paul, and the other New Testament writers and even Old Testament writers disagree with all of these unlawful actions, teaching us to submit to the civil government. Remember that Paul lived under the cruel occupying forces of Rome which was not exactly favorable to Christians. In our readings, Peter calls Christians to do the same. They were not only talking about the good governors, but government authorities in general. They command us to be subject to governing authorities because there is no authority except from God. And they have specific examples of what Christians ought to do in relation to the civil government. Our supplemental reading in Article 36 of the Belgic Confession of Faith summarizes the scriptures teaching about the relationship between God and the civil government. This Confession of Faith, as a short, a brief background, 
was written in 1561 by um, a French-speaking pastor in the southern lowlands north of France, present-day Belgium and the Netherlands. His name is Guido de Bray. Uh, at that time, the Roman Catholic Church was severely persecuting the Protestant reformers with imprisonment, confiscation of property, torture, and martyrdom. His purpose in writing this confession was to alleviate this persecution by pointing out to two main things about the reformers. So first, the faith of the reformers is nothing else than what the scriptures teach and what the early church taught. Second, the reformers he maintained were not rebels against the city government, uh, the civil government, like the radical Anabaptists. This radical wing of the Reformation rejected the civil government as God's ordained authority, and so they refused military service, they refused taking oaths, and they refused paying taxes. But the reformers in the lowlands also vowed to be faithful to God's word even on the pain of torture and death by the Spanish Inquisition. In the preface to this confession, the reformers declared that they would, and I quote, they would offer their backs to stripes, stripes their tongues to knives, their mouths to gags, and their whole bodies to the fire for the true gospel of Christ. They were true to their word. About 100,000 Reformed believers were martyred by the Roman Catholic Church in the lowlands alone. Article 36 of the Belgian Confession summarizes three teachings of the scripture regarding the civil government. The first teaching, which we will study today, says that God himself ordained the civil government. The second teaching concerns the relationship between the church and the civil government. And the third and last teaching is about the Christian's response and duty towards the civil government. So we will study the second and third teachings in the next two Lord's Days. So our theme today is God and the civil government under uh, two headings, uh, which uh, you can find in your sermon notes. So the first is, God ordained the civil government. Paul in Romans 13 gives the main reason why we ought to be subject to governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So government is instituted and appointed by God. When a citizen violates the laws of the land, he is condemned by God. Therefore, submitting to the civil government is submitting to God himself. Government in general is a blessing to the people. Sometimes God gives good civil authorities who are not a terror to good conduct. And Christians should thank God when their civil magistrate uh, governs with wisdom, justice, and righteousness, and upholds the rule of law. But sometimes God raises up evil rulers as a means of testing or even punishing nations, as when God's wrath came upon Judah because of King Hezekiah's pride. In the Old Testament, God's chosen nation Israel was ruled by his appointed kings. Israel was a theocracy, which means the rule by God through a king. In contrast to a democracy, a rule by the people through elected representatives. Israel's kings were subject to the law of Moses. Uh, the law of Moses can be divided into three classes, civil, 
ceremonial, and moral. The civil laws regulate the civil society and when, uh, were enforced by the kings. The ceremonial laws concern the religious life of the nation, including regulations for priests, sacrifices, and worship. These were enforced by the priests. The moral laws were, were mainly the Ten Commandments, which regulated the moral life of the people and enforced by the kings and to a certain extent by the priests. This system of governing the civil, religious, and moral life of the nation of Israel was appointed by God through the law of Moses, found mostly in the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. But when Israel was conquered by Assyria and Babylon, this theocracy under the house of King David ended. Israel came under the rules of pagan kings, uh, the pagan kings of Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and finally Rome. So therefore, in the New Testament, Israel was ruled by the Roman kings, but they were still allowed to retain their civil, ceremonial, and moral laws under the Roman government's supervision. However, in AD 70, Roman forces destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, which ended also the ceremonial laws of the Jews, the religious ceremonies of the Jews. We might think that God ordains only good government, but even Israel's best kings were tainted by sin. They were flawed. For example, David, Josiah, and Hezekiah. They were good kings, but they were also sinners. God ordains even wicked pagan kings. The best example is in our reading in Isaiah 44 and 45, King Cyrus II of Persia. When he defeated Babylon, he took over the Jews exiled in the land. But later, in 538 BC, Cyrus decreed the return of the exiles back to Canaan. So how did, how did this pagan king happen to let Israel go back to their homeland? We read about this in Isaiah's prophecy about this king almost two centuries before this Persian king came to power. So in Isaiah 44:28, uh, we read uh, what God says of Cyrus. He is my shepherd, and he shall fulfill all my purpose. Continuing in I Isaiah 45, 1 through 4, we read, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, I name you, though you do not know me. And then we read in Ezra 1, verse 1, that the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make this decree happen. It was the Lord's doing that Cyrus signed the decree. God calls a pagan king his shepherd and his anointed. The word anointed in the Old Testament is the Messiah. In the New Testament, the Christ. Cyrus, a pagan king, God's shepherd and anointed one, who would fulfill his purpose of restoring his people back to their homeland. And this is why we read in Proverbs 21, 1 and 2, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. The hearts of all men, including kings, are known and are subject to God's will. So firstly, the civil government is ordained by God. Secondly, the civil government is ordained by God to maintain good order. So God is a God of order. 
when he created the heavens and the earth, he created everything in good order, everything in its own place. He made the borders between land and sea. He separated day and night. He created birds to fly in the air, fish to swim the sea, and animals to walk on land. He created the sun, the moon, and the stars, the galaxies, and the nebulae with their designated fixed courses in the heavens. We will always see majestic and beautiful sunrises and sunsets until we die or until Jesus returns from heaven. The intricate and minute details of all his creation and their relationships to one another are unfathomable. With all human knowledge, there is no end in scientific and medical discoveries about God's creation. So therefore, when God finished his work of creation, he said it was very good. When he established the nation Israel, he ordered its civil, religious, and moral life in great detail in the law of Moses. And that, that is why we find reading um, the books of um, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy so boring because it was very repetitious. It was very detailed. There was a system of regulations and specific punishments for specific violations of these regulations. In its religious life, we read of de uh, detailed regulations concerning the priesthood, the sacrifices, and temple worship. Every small violation of these laws had specific punishments. When Israel disobeyed these laws, chaos descended on the nation, and God came down against them with wrathful judgment. We read about the disorder in the nation when there was no righteous king to enforce God's law. In Judges 21, 25, we read, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And this is what we see today in our nation. Without a moral compass, everyone is doing what is right in his own mind. Our present culture is a culture of everything goes. Whatever one thinks is right is allowed. If a child says 2 plus 2 equals 5, he has a right to say that. If a man says he is a woman, then he is a woman, and vice versa. If someone says rioting and looting is justified because of so-called social injustice, then looting and rioting is right. If a woman says she would not have been so successful if she did not have an abortion, then abortion is a good thing. If an illegal alien says he has a right to stay and to work in this country because it is a free country, then open our borders to all illegal aliens. If a fire was started by an arsonist, then the fire was caused by climate change. If CNN reports that the coronavirus did not originate from China, then calling it the Chinese plague is racist. If an armed sub, uh, suspect <clears throat> resisted arrest and threatened a police officer, then go rioting, looting, and defund, defund the police and murder police officers. If you support law and order, those opposed against you can beat you up. If a pastor preaches against this kind of culture, then the state has a right to close down the church and even jail the pastor. This is our culture today. Without the scriptures and without God, our nation is descending into disorder and anarchy. Black Lives Matter and the Antifa are not just racists, they are anarchists 
who threaten to create disorder and violence if they do not do, uh, get what they want. And what do they want? They want Marxist socialism for our nation, disguised in the pious slogan, social justice, a system that has never worked in any country and at any time in the history of the world, a system that is never found in the Bible, a system that has fomented disorder, revolution, poverty, immorality, and the slaughter of tens of millions. What does the scripture say about God? In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul rebuked the church because of their disorder and confusing worship. Many were babbling in tongues at the same time. So Paul says that if a visitor came to worship with them, he would say that they were insane. That was what his words, that they were out of their minds. They were insane. And so Paul reminded them, God is not a God of confusion, but of order. Verse 33. He is not a God of chaos, disorder, and confusion, but of peace and order. He has established his laws to regulate all human, civil, religious, and moral life. For us Christians, these laws of order are found only in our Constitution. Our Constitution is the Bible. For unbelievers, God has written his law in their hearts and in their minds. We call this conscience. Therefore, even if they do not know our Lord Jesus Christ and reject him, they know very well when they violate God's laws and to order their lives. There is no excuse for them. And so, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, all the rulers of this world, presidents, prime ministers, and all local officials are ordained by God. Their authority is given to them by God. God established the civil government to maintain good order in all nations. If there is no civil government, there will be lawlessness, and the civil society would disintegrate, and the whole world would destroy itself. Although God does not seem to be sovereign over all rulers today, he actually rules over all earthly rulers even now. But in the end, we read in Daniel 2.44, God shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end. And Christ shall make his enemies a footstool for his feet. The scriptures command the civil government to put no obstacle to the preaching of the true gospel in the church. But the word of God also commands all Christians to pray for the civil government and to submit to it because it is God's instrument to punish evil and reward the good. We will study this in the next two Lord's Days. Let us pray. Gracious and glorious Lord, you have fed us with your word, the bread of life. Bless it and make it health and strength to us as we strive and prosper until our obedience reaches the measure of your love. You who have done everything for us, fill us with your Holy Spirit so we may pray for and obey our civil authorities because you have appointed them even those who are unrighteous. For we too are sinful and unrighteous. Grant this, dear Father, for your dear Son, Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Let us now stand and sing our song of response. Rejoice, the Lord is King, number 200.